Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given many precious, uh, many great and precious promises that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world through lust. Before we open God's word together this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to study your word, to be reminded of your plan and your purpose to look at the grand scope of your plan that goes truly beyond anything we could ask or think, understanding that in your providential care you have orchestrated history from the time of the fall until the future when uh, we are entering into the eternal state. And Father, we pray that as we study your word, that it might strengthen us spiritually, encourage us, help us to understand more fully who we are as Christians in this church age and what that has to do with your plan and purpose for our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And this morning we're going to start a new section. We're starting the section in Ephesians 4, 7 through 16, which is a tremendous uh, section. There's a lot here, and it really is the prelude and the foundation for understanding what will come after it. One of the things that I want to do a little bit this morning in the introduction is just to give us a, a, a sense of the overview here so that we don't lose... Uh, lose, lose the uh, forest for the trees so we understand what, what Paul is really getting at in all of this. And so in doing this, before we get into our topic of the ascension of Christ and why that's important for our spiritual life, I want to give you all a little pop quiz this morning. Something for you to just think about. And I've got uh, about four questions here that I want to ask you, and don't answer, don't raise your hand. I want you to think about it. You can write down your answers as we go through this and then reflect upon it later on. But the purpose for asking these questions is to help us think about why Paul is saying the things that he's doing and why this is structured the way it is. So the first question has to do with the last verses that we have looked at, the three verses from verse 4, 5, and 6. And so I want you to think about it as I read it and just think about what you think the key word is in this section. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, not a tough question. What is the key word here? It is the key word one. And the context is talking about this unity that we are to make every effort in verse 3 to maintain that which is already established at salvation, to keep or maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, if you look down in your Bible to verse 14, Paul comes back to this theme in verse 13, and he gives it, the way he expresses this, saying, until we all come to the unity of the faith, that shows that this is the ultimate destiny or the reason for everything he says between talking about the positional unity we have in Christ and the experiential aspect in verse verse 13. So he's talking about unity. Why would he talk about unity? What have we seen in the the context? 
Well, in the context, he's talking about back in chapter 2, it's been a lot of time that there's this division between Jew and Gentile. But then if we were to skim forward into the last part of chapter 4 and, and chapter 5 and even into chapter 6 some, we'll see indications that there was a problem within the congregation. There's problems of sins that are cause, causing uh, problems in the relationships, the personal relationships of, of people. Uh, it talks about uh, not lying and not being angry, not stealing, not, uh, not uh, just the sins of the tongue. Where he talks about let no uh, corrupt word come, come out of your mouth. And then the importance of walking in love and walking in the light in chapter 5, ending with talking about uh, role relationships in marriage and in family and in business. So he, the, a major part of this epistle is dealing in one way or another with problems that people have with other people. Now that's important to understand that, so we're just going to keep that back there. This is emphasizing he keeps talking about the solution for this problem of, of breakdowns, the breakdown in relationships. Now the second question is, in verses 1 through 4 of this chapter, what would you say this is related to? Is this related to application of the word or is it instruction related to what we have been given and who we are? Okay, those are multiple choice. Is it talking about the application of the word or instruction related to what we have been given or who we are? So Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity or making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So is that going to be A, application, or B, instruction? It's going to be A. This is application. Okay? Now, we move on and we look at the next section that is coming up. Now, we've read it already a few times in our uh, uh, congregational reading of Scripture, but I'm going to read this, and I want you to answer, does this talk about application of the Word, or is this talking about instruction related to what we have been given and who we are? But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So is that application or is that instruction related to what we have been given or who we are in Christ? That's B. It is instruction. Now the reason I bring this out is because as we look at Ephesians as a whole, the first three chapters are often said to be the doctrinal section. This is the instructional section teaching us about who we are and what we have been given in Christ. But there's a lot of sections, verses in there that are talking about ap application that are mixed in there. But when we get to the second half, that's often spoken of as the application section, but there's a lot of instruction that comes within it. And so let's put that together with what we saw in the first question, that the problem is a problem with uh, personal relationships, is to give it a broad category, and the solution in terms of the of, of the instruction is related to who we are in Christ and what we have been given. So now we come to the this last question, 
I've already given away a lot of this. What is the problem that, God, that Paul has been addressing here in especially Ephesians 2.11 down to the present? So it's multiple choice. Is it A, the problem of the inadequacies of their personal relationships and the need for a spiritual formation group to share your problems and difficulties? B, the problem of not understanding your social identity group and conforming to it. C, the problem of a lack of justice for your socioeconomic group. D, the problem is the failure of the Roman Empire to deal with the socioeconomic disparities of the culture. Or E, the problem of disunity between Jew and Gentile, but also between believers. And the solution is to understand what God has provided for us in the church age through the ascension of Christ. And you see those first four represent the human viewpoint attempts to solve life's problems on our own apart from Christ. What's interesting is the same time that I am looking at this section, i am also been preparing my lecture notes for the next couple of weeks in church history. And one of the things that, uh, that we're going to be covering is sort of tracing the development of uh, religious liberalism from the late 18th century up to the beginning of the 20th century. And without going into all of the details, I think it can be summarized that once you have the sort of philosophical revolution brought in by Immanuel Kant, where you can't know truth as it is, you can only know your perception of truth, then what happens is the center of knowledge and the center of truth shifts from being outside of us, that there's real objective knowledge and real objective truth. You can know things as they really truly are. You can know reality for what it is. And now you can't really know any of that. You only know your perception, so it shifts to inside. And so the, all you can know is your subjective impressions and perceptions of things. So you can't really know if God exists, but it makes you feel better if you do. And you can't really know um, uh, about anything, life beyond, but it, it makes you feel better if you do. And what happens as you go through this chain of uh, European thinkers like Friedrich Schleiermacher and uh, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach and David Strauss and a number of others all the way down to Kierkegaard at the end, is you see this progressive shift in thinking that, that everything is really about me. It's all about what's going on inside of me, and you can't really know God. There may not even be a God. In fact, under Feuerbach and, and Strauss, there's no God at all, but, but we, we've had religion because, because we can project out of ourselves uh, something about God, and we sort of need that in this sort of immature stage of the human race uh, to, to make life work. But now we've got to grow beyond all of that. And so the real solutions to life are going to be found through, um, through psychology. We got that from Freud, uh, through coming to grips with uh, various things, and we turn to sociology. And it, it's all about... Uh, looking inside of ourselves to find the solution. And see, this is what happens in these uh, spiritual formation groups. It sounds like a really nice thing, but all it is is an opportunity for a small group to get together and talk about uh, their problems and their sins, and it has its roots in medieval mysticism, but it's become oh so popular throughout all of Protestantism in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And it's all because we can't quite come to grips with the reality that we still live in a sinful world as Christians, and we're still corrupt sinners as Christians. We may be new creatures in Christ, but we don't live like it, and we still have a problem with sin. And this has always plagued Christianity since the ascension of Christ, is that Christians just don't know what to do with the fact that after they're saved, they still sin. And see, that's what the spiritual life is all about, is trying to un understand those things. And now, in modern times, we come up with these ideas that everybody's in a specific group, and you have to, 
uh, group think. You have to think like everybody else in that way. So if you're a woman, you're always going to vote Democrat, and you're always going to vote for the feminist because that's what you're supposed to do as a woman. If you're black, then you always vote in a block. If you're Hispanic, you always vote in a block. If you're a laborer, you always vote with all the labor, all of this kind of stuff. And it all flows out of these uh, these various philosophies that have their roots back in, in the 19th century. And so we are defining life this way, but the other part that, that came in in the 19th century and all these different philosophies, they had one other thing in common. They denied that man was a sinner. That they, said, they got this from a religious apostasy that began in the early 19th century, and then it just sort of morphed from there and that everybody is basically good. They're born as pure and innocent and neutral as Adam was created, and yet, yet they sin. But if your starting point is that we're all born spiritually dead and corrupt sinners, th then you have to have laws in order to restrain that inherent bent towards sin and corruption. If, on the other hand, you're basically born good without that taint of sin and you just become a sinner because you commit sins, then the result is we just have to uh, make you want to be more moral and not sin. The person who is born corrupt in a world that is inhabited by corrupt sinners will never achieve perfection aside from some change from God who transforms people and transforms cultures and civilizations. On the other hand, if there is no God and we're all born basically good, then what we have to do is have uh, government or other entities do those things which will enable us to get rid of uh, get rid of social sins, get rid of national sins, and then we can bring in a utopia. And the idea of a future utopia is just stolen from Christianity because it has, it has taken the uh, promise of Scripture that there will be a time in the future that the Messiah will come back and establish his perfect kingdom of righteousness and that he will personally rule and there will be a kingdom of, of, of perfect righteousness. And so once you get rid of God and Jesus isn't divine, then you secularize that idea of that future kingdom. And then that becomes your focal point is to create that utopia apart from God on the basis of the innate goodness of man. But if there's no innate goodness of man, then your hope is built on fallen creatures and their corruption. And so authority will always... It, trend toward corruption and that there will ultimately be no perfect government and there will be no perfect president and there will be no perfect king or kingdom. And so then you're, the only way you can try to f force it is to bring in tyranny. All of this was clearly understood by the founding fathers. And so th this is the problem. And when you start getting into this, as we have in, in Ephesians, what you realize is there's always these problems with people. The solution doesn't lie in any of these human viewpoint techniques or philosophies or psychologies. It has to do with what the Scripture says. Because when Paul has laid out the problem here, what's so interesting is that Paul doesn't say, okay, we need to all get in a little self-help group and figure out how we can all solve our problems. And he doesn't say, well, we just need to have some changes in the economy, the way we have economies so we can have equity in our, uh, the way income is spread out and then we're gonna, everything's gonna be okay. He says, if you wanna solve this problem, we have to understand what God has done for us in the ascension of Christ. And so we need to go start in the Old Testament and understand the significance of Christ's ascension to heaven and why that was necessary. So that is what we are going to begin to study as we go through this next section from verse 7 down through verse, uh, verse 16. Because this verse begins with, but to each one of us,
Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And the next thing he does in verse 8, he says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So the point is that his, the solution starts with understanding this, and very few people have ever taken the time to really pursue the questions that we're going to look at over the next four or five weeks as we go through what the Scripture says about the ascension. I've read this already, but I want you to note the verbs that, and words that I have highlighted here. On the one hand, we have words related to the fact that we are given something. Each one of us, grace was given. Now, this is going to develop down in verse 11 to 12 to some of the spiritual gifts. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Notice the standard always takes us back to, to God and to his person. And then there is a quote from Psalm 68, 18, so we'll have to go look at that. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. There's a relationship there. He had to ascend before he could give these gifts. So this ascension is important. In, in John 14 through 16, several times he says, I must go to the Father before I can send the Spirit. Now why is that? What's going on there? There was no giving of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Right there we see this is going to have to be understood and is understood within a dispensational framework. That means that, that God did not administer the affairs of the human race, oversee them in the Old Testament the way he is in the church age. And in the church age there are certain things, a vast number of things, that are then given to believers in order to enable them to face the problems and difficulties of life and to grow to spiritual maturity. So we see this connection between his ascension and the uh, gifts that he gives. That's highlighted in verses 9 and 10. In verse 11 it says, and he himself, so you have uh, the reflexive pronoun used there himself to emphasize that it, this is specifically, the giving of these gifts is specifically in the domain of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these gifts are also mentioned as gifts given by the Spirit, but ultimately we see they are given by Christ. And why would that be? Because they are gifts given to the body of Christ, to the church. We are the body of Christ, and he is the head. So as the authority over the church, he is the one who distributes these leadership gifts. And so we'll have to talk about those. And what's the purpose for those gifts? Is for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. A couple of things we note there is it's about equipping believers. That's who saints are. Anybody who's a believer in Christ has been set apart to God as a believer and is a saint. And so he, we are to equip the saints. Now the first two gifts are no longer in existence. They were only part of the early church, apostles and prophets. And then the second two, evangelists and pastor teachers, these are given to the church to equip the saints. And we often think of an evangelist as the purpose of evangelism. No, his job is to teach others how to do evangelism. That doesn't mean he's not going to be engaged in evangelism. But in the 19th century, early 19th century, a heretic, I believe, apostate named Charles Granderson Finney was the first one to come along as a professional evangelist. And Finney was a mess, and he has his part of the results of Finney is that he brought so much garbage into visible Christianity that we're still dealing with the negative effects of it now. He's the one who said, Oh, the people are basically good. We just have to motivate them somehow to want to do the right thing. But they start off wanting to do good. And he was post-millennial because good people can bring in the kingdom and then Jesus can come back. And so we, he has that whole utopic idea in there. But he said the way to motivate them is if they just don't want to uh, come forward to trust in Christ, 
then we have to make them. So we'll sing 68 verses of just as I am and wear them out until they're, uh, they're too tired to fight it and they'll just come forward. Or, and then he came up with something called the anxious bench. And he came up with this idea of, of taking people aside and counseling them. And, but he didn't believe in the uh, depravity of man. He didn't believe that we were born sinners because of Adam's original sin. Uh, he didn't believe Christ died to pay the legal penalty for sin on the cross. He just died to be an example of God's, the way God governs the universe and that God doesn't like sin and he will punish it. And so you have to be good. He introduces an extreme level of legalism within Christianity that is just swallowed hook, line, and sinker. And then, then third, because man is perf it was born perfect and is perfectible, then we can perfect society and we can bring in the kingdom. But we have to get rid of all of these national sins. And so most of the major movements that characterize American history for the last 160 years was really came right out of Phineism. Not that some of those things weren't good things, but they were good things that were done the wrong way, done out of human effort, human righteousness, without doing God's, way, God's work God's way. It's doing it man's way. And so the first thing was the abolition of slavery. And because it was done differently in the United States than it was in England, because the, those who wanted to end slavery in England were evangelicals who believed in the depravity of man. So they're not trying to perfect society. They're just trying to end things that are evil, not for the purpose of bringing in the kingdom. That, you, you're as arrogant as you can be if you think you can bring in the kingdom. And arrogance always produces a reaction. And the reaction is arrogance in the opposite direction. And what happens when you get two arrogant people butting heads? It leads to a war. So the abolitionists in America, extreme ab abolitionism came out of Finney. And what happens? They are so arrogant that they cause an equal and opposite reaction to those in the South who are already oriented towards arrogance. And everything blew up here in a huge war between the states. That didn't happen in England because the leaders who wanted to end slavery, end the slave trade and end slavery, were evangelical believers. They believed in the total depravity of man. They humbled themselves under the hand of God, and God is the one who brought it about. They didn't try to force feed it uh, to the people out of arrogance, and it made a huge difference. That's one of my favorite examples to show that doctrine really makes a difference. Dependence upon God makes a difference. If you do it out of your own effort, it's always going to end up bad. So we have to understand that, that we do it God's way. So what we do is we have to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, not motivate them through emotionalism and... Uh, uh, just uh, self-absorption in order to do what God wants them to do. They have to know the Word, and that's preparing them for ministry by teaching them the Word, edifying the body of Christ toward the goal of uni the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man and the fullness of Christ. So that gives us that overview, and it starts with understanding that Christ had to ascend to heaven before he could give spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts, those leadership gifts, are necessary in order to equip the believers so that they can minister and so that they can grow to spiritual maturity. So we need to notice as we look at the flow of Paul's thought in Ephesians, that he approaches the problem not on the basis of sociology, not on the basis of psychology, not on the basis of just getting the right kind of methodology, but we have to go back to the scriptures and we have to do what the scripture says. So when we look at this passage talking about the ascension of Christ and spiritual gifts, there are some questions that ought to come to our mind. The first is, why did Christ have to ascend at all? Why did he have to go to heaven? Why couldn't he just have stayed here on the earth and establish his kingdom? 
Why did he have to go to heaven? And Psalm 110, 1 tells us that he ascends to heaven and then he sits not on his throne because we're not in, in despite what some, a lot of people say, we're not in any form of the kingdom now. Because to have a kingdom, you have to have a king, and Jesus isn't sitting on his throne. There's no place that mentions Jesus sitting on his throne. He's at his Father's throne, Revelation 3.21, that, that he talks about, I am sitting, you will, in the kingdom, sit with me on my throne, even as I now sit on my Father's throne. He's not sitting on the throne of David in heaven. That's amillennialism. We'll get into all of these things as we go along. But there's no kingdom now. Why was the kingdom postponed? What is happening in this age between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ? What is God doing with the church? What is our purpose? The second question is going to be, why did Christ have to ascend before sending the Spirit? Why didn't he just say, come on, Father, send the Spirit now, and we can, we can develop things together? He had to ascend first before the Holy Spirit could descend. Third, we should be asking, why did Christ have to ascend before spiritual gifts could be given? Now, we often think about, oh, well, didn't they have some kind of spiritual gift in the Old Testament? You had prophets and you had people who, who uh, some of the prophets healed and other things. But those weren't spiritual gifts. Those were never called gifts of the Holy Spirit. They may be similar, but it's the differences. We talk about this a lot. It's the differences that matter, not the similarities. So you have things that are going on in the Old Testament that are endowments from God, but they're not the same as these spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit. And then we have to ask this question, what this is the connection between the ascension of Christ and the giving of gifts. So we just have to start basically with the ascension. What is the ascension of Christ? The word ascend basically means to go up. And so we have uh, three key passages talking about the ascension. The first is the short one. This is at the end of Mark, and Mark just gives us, he's in a hurry. Have you never, ever noticed, you read the Gospel of Mark, next time underline all the places where, and then, and then they did this, and they did, he's always in a hurry. Immediately they did this, immediately they did that, immediately they did this. And so by the time you get through reading all of Mark, you're just, <laughs> you've been running a race. So everything is, is somewhat abbreviated. He says at the end, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, that is the disciples, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So he gives us the broad overview. This is what happened. He's, he gives instructions to the disciples, doesn't give us any idea what they were. And then he is received or taken up into heaven and this is the uh, Greek word analambano, which means to take up or to raise or to take something to yourself. And it is in the passive voice. That means if it was in the active voice, I would say Jesus lifted himself up. He would be performing the action. But it's in a passive voice. He receives the action of being lifted up or being taken up uh, into heaven. And then what? He sat down. That's an active voice verb. Jesus sits down, not on the Father's throne, but he sits down at the right hand of God. That was what um, was predicted in Psalm 110, uh, 1. When my Lord, uh, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand, and I will make your enemies your footstool. And that's a promise we're going to have to look at is Psalm 110. Now, Luke gives us a little more information. Luke is that careful historian. He wants to take us through the details. And he gives us some in Luke, but then when he gets to his second book, which is Acts, which picks up where Luke ends, he gives us a lot more detail. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father. What's the promise of, he's talking about here? The promise of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, before he ascends, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, Old English for stay, stay put, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power 
from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up to heaven. So these two verbs here are the uh, estimai, which means to be, he is being set apart. It's an aorist active indicative, so just simply summarizing the action of being set apart and separated. And what separates him from them is the second verb on a pharaoh that he has taken up. And again, this is in the passive voice. So he is receiving the action he's taken up, carried into heaven. Now, this map gives us a little bit of an understanding of the layout of Jerusalem in New Testament times. Here you have the temple. On the east side of the temple is the Kidron Valley. Just across from the temple was the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of you have, have been there with me. And then you have a long ridge line that goes along, goes from sort of uh, uh, northwest to southeast, and this is the Mount of Olives. It's not a mountain peak. If you're thinking a mountain like you'd see in Wyoming or you would see in Colorado, don't think about that, or even up in some places in the, in the Appalachians. It, it's just a good high ridge. The, the terrain here is a lot like the terrain you'd find out in the hill country of Texas. So he goes up onto, crosses the Kidron Valley, goes up the Mount of Olives, and this is a picture of the Mount of Olives. This is this steeple you see just the top of over here on the left. That is the Church of the Ascension that is allegedly marks the spot where the Ascension took place. All of this, these white stones here are all graves. This is a Jewish graveyard. And this is looking at the ridge line across the top, which is uh, the Mount of Olives. And uh, that's the place from which Jesus ascended. So in Acts 1, and I'm not hitting everything there, and we'll wrap up with this, being assembled together with them, that's the 11 disciples, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So Luke's consistent with the way he concluded his gospel, uh, which he said, you have heard from me, just just after the uh, resurrection, or just before the crucifixion, he's teaching them that he has to go to the Father so that the Spirit can come. And then, skipping a couple of verses, he says in, to them in verse 8, but you shall, future tense, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, that's the city they're in, Judea and Samaria, that is the uh, provinces surrounding Jerusalem, and then to the end of the earth. And then we read, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. Again, it's a passive voice verb. He is taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the cloud is the subject of that verb receive. He basically, he's ascending, and they're watching and this cloud just envelops him as he is going up to heaven. No one had ever seen anything like this before. You, you've got, we've all seen science fiction movies. We've seen people get beamed up by Scotty. And we've seen, uh, air, we've been on airplanes. And we've seen rockets launch and take people up into outer space. But no one at this point had ever seen this kind of thing happen before. You can just imagine their, their, their mouths drop open and they're following up. We don't know how long it took for Jesus to ascend, whether it was slow or whether it was fast, but he uh, ascends. And they're looking up. And they just keep looking. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. You just, this is such a dramatic scene. They're just spellbound. They're not aware of what's happening around them. They're just stunned that Jesus has ascended to heaven. And then all of a sudden, these two angels appear next to them, and they don't see them for a while. And finally, they, they <clears throat> men of Galilee, you know, getting their attention, pay attention to us. And he says, why do you stand gazing up to heaven? 
This same Jesus, now notice that's really important, that this this is the same Jesus in the same body. Now remember, Jesus had a human body that was added to his deity, and a human nature added to his deity, and when he was put in the grave, that same human body was transformed into his resurrection body. God didn't create a new body different from the one he had walked around in on earth. It's transformed, though, into a resurrection body. And it has different properties, but it's still made from the same material that was part of that uh, original mortal, uh, mortal body. And he's taken up into heaven, and he will come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, a couple of things we ought to note there. There are a lot of people who've come along and said, well, Jesus came back. That was Jesus that came back as the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. No. That he'd, if, that was, if that was Jesus, he didn't come back in the same way, did he? What they're saying is Jesus is going to come back the same way. You're going to observe him physically descending to the Mount of Olives. You also have those who say, well, Jesus came back and began the kingdom. These are, these are pr called preterists. They believe Jesus has already returned in the past, that he returned in judgment, the clouds of judgment, in A.D. 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, wait a minute. Did anybody see him? Was anybody watching him? Did he come down physically, bodily at that time? No, that didn't happen. You have other people who are saying other things about Jesus coming and returning, but none of them are talking about what the Scripture says in Zechariah 14.4. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives at the second coming, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half to the south. This is when Jesus comes back and Im immediately after this will destroy the armies of the, of the Antichrist. That's the second coming. It's going to be just like his return is going to be just like his departure. It's going to be physical, bodily, and he's going to go up into heaven. So we're going to have to stop here, but we'll come back next time. And we have to look at the background to the ascension. Why does this have to take place? What is going on here? Why is this related to the promise? Because to understand, to answer those questions is to help us understand why we have been given the Holy Spirit in this church age and what God is doing through us in the church during this church age that is distinct from every other uh, dispensation in history. And so we'll continue this next week with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at these things, to see that the word uh, emphasizes this so many different places, and to help us to understand just exactly what is transpiring as the Holy Spirit was to be sent, and what the Holy Spirit is doing in doing something new in this entity called the church, the body of Christ. And Father, help us to understand that because this is the same thing Paul's been saying in terms of abolishing the enmity between Jew and Gentile in chapter 2 and creating the unity that is in the body of Christ. And all of this is integral to understanding how we as Christians are to solve problems and social problems and economic problems and political problems don't have social, economic, and political solutions. Ultimately, they have solutions grounded in our relationship to you and the obedience to your word. So, Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to these things in the coming weeks as we study your word. And, Father, we too pray for those who might be here or those who may be watching online or now or later that the way to salvation, the way to eternal life, the gift of eternal life is received only by faith, that it is without cost to us and that you have given us, offered us eternal life at no cost to us, free of charge, that the only thing required, the way to receive it, is to simply trust in Christ as Savior, to believe on him, because he did all of the work on the cross. He paid the full penalty of sin on the cross.
so that that problem is no longer our issue. The issue now is that we're still spiritually dead. We need to be made alive, and that comes only by faith, and that it's not by works. It's only by Christ's work on the cross. And when we trust him, we are given that righteousness necessary to be able to uh, go to heaven, and we're given eternal life. Father, we rejoice that we have confidence that we have eternal salvation through Christ our Lord and his death on the cross, and pray that you will make that clear to any who's list who are listening. And we pray this in